Great, thanks for the invitation. And as I, I said informally before, since uh, this is a topic that you probably don't see too many uh, presentations about, I will, I'll try to step us through uh, slowly and then accelerate rapidly towards the end. Okay, so um, the work that I'm going to talk about today has done in collaboration with, uh, with these European fellows in Munich and um, in Berlin and in University of uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Um, <clears throat> there's two papers out, which the archive numbers are here. And then the third one, which I, I'm highlighting here, is, the, is, an, is a computational physics paper, which is sort of underlying the, the phenomenology that we, we did in, the, in those first two papers. So um, this second paper is associated with the open source release of the code, which I think is a very um, good policy in physics. You know, if you write something that produces results uh, for the paper, you should, you should release it to the public so they can take a look at it and potentially benefit from it. Okay, so the topic for today will be monium suppression in the quark and plasmas, and I'll try to show you how you can go from effective field theories to modeling the non-unitary quantum evolution of, the, of uh, bottom monium states in, in the QGP. Uh, advanced slide. All right, so QGP. So the basic cartoon version is that you know below uh, approximately 10 to the 12 Kelvin, we have nice bound states, protons, uh, neutrons, and pions all hadrons. And as if we were to increase the temperature above, you know, roughly 10 to the 12 Kelvin, um, we'll, we'll generate this state of, of quark and plasma. And we know a lot about the, the QTP phase diagram. There's a lot of things we don't know, but uh, we do know at least uh, the approximate location as a function of temperature of this, this phase transition in the vicinity of mu b is equal to zero. So this is baryon symmetric matter. And we, we know the equation has stayed along this line quite well. And we know that this uh, transition between the hadron gas phase and the quark long plasma phase is in fact a crossover in this regime. That means it's not first order or second order, it's formally infinite order uh, phase transition in which we sort of smoothly go from this hadron gas phase in the low temperature into the quark long plasma phase. Now, I won't talk about it, the rest of the phase diagram today, uh, but it's uh, postulated that this uh, crossover will end in a, um, in a second order uh, critical point that starts the beginning of a first order phase transition line. And then over here is the vicinity of, of uh, dense uh, neutron stars and, and interesting things like that. Quark long plasma, uh, at least at highest LHC energies, is living over in this region of the phase diagram. We generate nearly bary uh, baryosymmetric matter, and then it, it cools down and goes to this, this crossover here. Now, um, as you know, there's a worldwide effort to describe the time evolution of this matter, and it relies, in the end, heavily on what's relativistic viscous hydrodynamics. And with that, you can make predictions for, say, the spectra of pions, protons, kaons, and their flow, and all of those things, um, which are all very interesting and, and quite well understood now. What this talk is going to be about is, is something different, which is what are the other probes of the quark and plasma that we might consider? Now, the main, uh, well, not the main, two, two possibilities are, are high energy, jet, high energy jets. Um, that's because this, this phase over here is color ionized and it has much stronger um, color force interactions. If I shoot a color charged particle through here, it's gonna get, lose a lot more energy than if I shoot it through this um, on average colorless combination of, uh, of quarks and, and gluons in the form of, of hadrons. The one I'm gonna talk about today is what happens if I take a, a bound state, in this case, a, a meson constructed from a bottom and an anti-bottom quark, and I try to embed it in this, in this medium over here. Now, bottomonium uh, itself has, has a very large binding energy on the order of 500 MeV. So you would expect that it could live to roughly 500 MeV in the plasma. And then it will itself uh, break up um, into uh, free bottom and anti-bottom quarks. And the, the basic idea is to kind of use that breakup as a, as a thermometer. So if we, you know, it wasn't quark and plasma research, uh, but we could do this in a, in a lab, in a box, um, we, would, we would simply start shooting some bottomonium states through here and, and look at their survival probability as they shot through the box. And then by, by um, 
recording our experimental observations, we could infer the temperature of the plasma inside here. So that was the basic idea going back um, to Matsui and Sox back in the day that we can, we can infer properties of the quark gluon plasma by looking at how these highly bound, heavy quark bound states um, uh, survive or not survive. <laughs> Now the equation of state itself along that line, we, we have a, a very good understanding of, um, and this is just my summary slide of that. This is at, at mu b is equal to zero. Uh, the red points are the lattice data, in this case from the Wuppertal Budapest group um, as a function of temperature. And then there's two lines. The orange one is my cartoon version of a hadron resonance gas, which describes the, the lattice data quite well at temperatures below the phase transition uh, temperature. But as you go above this line of, of roughly 155 MeV, uh, you'll see that that no longer describes the, the lattice data. When what does describe the lattice data is this black curve, which is a uh, resummed three loop calculation in, in QCD uh, that was done by my, myself and collaborators. And I've drawn suggestively on this slide um, that the initial temperatures that we uh, we reach, um, or at least estimates thereof, at RIC, LHC, and um, the well, at least LHC run the first runs when they had the the problem with the magnets, and then finally everything was fixed and they were running at full energy. And then we can see at least at LHC full energies we've pushed well into this quark gluon plasma phase, and now um, our goal is in principle to start studying its its properties. So related to bottomonium, the, the fundamental physics that people were discussing in, in the late 80s, Matsui and Sats and Mir, was the physics of, of Debye screening. And here I've, I've drawn it for the case of uh, a, a QED plasma, so just an, an abelian plasma with plus and minus charges. And the basic idea is that if I have a bunch of liberated charges that can move around in the box and I, if I were to pin a plus charge down here, um, what I would find is that a shell, um, shells of minus and plus charges start collecting around it and they screen the interaction between this plus charge and, and another plus charge that might be sitting over here or minus charge um, at some distance. Uh, because the charge carriers are free to move around, uh, what Debye showed in, you know, in a century ago or so was that, uh, that this, what we would normally call the Coulomb force in the case of QED just becomes screened with some exponential screening where MD here is the Debye mass um, of the medium. And this Debye mass um, scales with the temperature. There's also a factor of G hiding here, but the higher I, I make the temperature, G in QCD runs logarithmically and it goes down. So the T is really the dominating term here. Um, this Debye mass uh, gets very large and eventually it will turn off all of the interactions due to the screening effect. And you can imagine that I try solving the bound state problem. Um, here I've just cooked it down to its one dimensional version. This is the um, is a nice coolant potential and our unscreened uh, vacuum potential. And the red dashed line is what happens when we turn the screening on. And then you could throw this into, into um, some computer or, um, and solve um, for the, the bound state spectrum. And um, if you solve in the case of the, of the coolant potential, you would have three bound states, let's say. I'm just drawing this as a cartoon. This might be the upsilon 1s, the upsilon 2s, and the upsilon 3s, and then whatever comes next. However, if we turn up the temperature, which means increasing the Debye mass, we get this screening effect, which brings us to the red curve. And if we then once again try to solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, what we'll find is that the, the masses have shifted a little bit, the eigenenergies. And also um, in this uh, cartoon example, I showed one of the states became unbound. So this is how in practice, these original predictions were that there would be an effect is, were made. And, and the prediction was that of course, the excited states will be affected first. So you'll start losing say the three S um, and then you'll lose the two S and then you'll use the, lose the one S um, as you keep on increasing the temperature because of this screening effect. And because of this, you can look at the, at the suppression of various um, states. And then by looking at how much they're suppressed, infer um, how, what the temperature is. So that was the, the original idea. 
And this, this figure here with some modifications by me came from, from Agnes originally. All right, so the, that was the, the first part of this slide here in a higher high temperature quark on plasma. We expect weaker color binding due to Debye screening leadingly, um, subleadingly due to asymptotic freedom itself. And, and these are the sort of historic papers that discussed this possibility. And this can be checked in, in the lattice. So what's shown on the, on the right up here is the singlet free energy as a function of the radius in Fermi's. The black is at T is equal to zero, and you can see the, the signature of a nice Cornell potential but, um, emerging in, in the singlet channel. And then as we increase the temperature, we see the screening effect. And it's affecting not just the, um, the intermediate distances associated with the Dubai uh, screening, it's also affecting the long range part of the potential and, and lattice can do that. So this is that sort of melting effect. But there's an, a, another effect that can be measured. And if, you, if you're working on the lattice, it means um, reconstructing the full spectral function of, of the states. And if you were to do that, what you would find is not only do you get this uh, decrease in, or modification of the potential, but also the states start to become very uh, wide um, um, in your spectral reconstruction. And this is due fundamentally to the second point that um, in addition to the screening, thing, they can move around. We also have lots of high energy particles that can interact with these bound states and, and um, basically cause them to break up. And in the case of quarkonium, the, um, this will be largely driven by gluon exchange because if I have a, a quarkonium state and it's in a singlet, it absorbs a gluon, it's going to be driven into an octet, which is a bound state. Um, so that's one way that it, it can break up. And if I have more high temperature gluons around, uh, that means I'll have a higher breakup rate and that, that leads to these larger spectral widths. So there's a kind of effect on the real part of the potential and this, um, this effect on the, on the widths, it can be encoded in a, an imaginary part of the potential that you use to solve the Schroeder equation. Below in the lower left is showing typical Upsilon um, observation data. This is as a, in the dyed muon uh, decay channel where my QQ bars decayed in electromagnetically to mu plus mu minus. I reconstruct the invariant mass of the mu plus mu minus um, and I see some background, but standing on side of this background, I can, I can identify the upsilon 1s, 2s, and 3s. And um, this data that's shown here on the left was collected in uh, PP collisions at, at this uh, center of mass energy. Now the, the cartoon version of this screening effect is, is if, I, if I were to look at this, if I were able to sit inside of the quark gluon plasma uh, and, and measure this, um, this observable, as I jacked up the temperature, what I would see is that it's getting broader and broader and broader. And eventually I'll see that these states are, are completely uh, gone. Now, this was in, in, in uh, PP. What happens when we collide uh, two lead nuclei together at, at LHC energies, and then we look for this same um, observable? So um, that's shown here on the right, um, but let's, let's first look at the left. This is um, the previous slide was from LHCB. This is from CMS. This is just normalized to the background. I like to show the CMS results because you can see all the tiny little points with their tiny little error bars here to just show you how high their resolution is and how excellently constructed this experiment is. On the right, as I said, is the, um, is the lead lead result also from CMS as a function of the invariant uh, mass of the dimuon pair. And we can immediately see with our eyes that something has happened here. The black dots are the, are the experimental data in, in lead lead. And we can see that the 3S is completely gone. The 2S has been highly suppressed and, and so has the 1S. The red dashed line that's sitting here is the expectation that you would have based on no quark quantum plasma being formed whatsoever. And the, the way we estimate that is by just calculating the average number of binary collisions per nucleus nucleus collision and, take, and simply taking the experimental PP result and scaling it up by the average number of binary collisions. 
So if this nucleus nucleus collision was basically a bunch of nucleon nucleon collisions, um, you should get the, the red curve. But we see that relative to that, it's highly suppressed. And as we, as we predicted, um, the, the bound states are showing a much larger effect than, than the ground state, and we really understand why. So I, I like this particular observable because I don't have to do a Fourier analysis of the quark one plasma to extract this. I can just make a plot like this and you can see with your naked eye that probably we created a quark one plasma. Now, of course, the devil's in the details in trying to predict theoretically by how much the, the 1s is suppressed and, and the 2s and the 3s and not, um, uh, in this case, it was integrated over all events and averaged, but in, you know, with some, uh, uh, some, some variables, which I'll describe later, which allow us some, to access some more differential suppression. Now, one thing that you should always be aware of in this topic is the fact that there can also be what are called cold nuclear matter effects. And um, going back to the 90s, when SPS was running, there, there were papers written from CERN where they claimed that charmonium, not, not bottomonium, which I'm talking about today, had um, been suppressed and they were they used this as you know, a signature of the quark one plasma but around that same time people started calculating what would be the effect if I instead of I collided a lead lead I, I collided p lead and uh, what you found is that the effect on, on charmonium was was also quite large and this had to do with the modification of the nuclear wave functions and also um, propagation of the j side through the nuclear material um, after it was formed um, What's shown here is the actual effect measured in, in bottomonium. So this is a P lead collision shown on the left now. And this is the, the scaled up result. If it was just a, um, this proton interacting independently with, with all of the nucleons it encountered while passing through this lead lead. And as we can see, this is, uh, there is an effect, but it's nothing on the order of, the magn of magnitude that we're seeing in the lead lead case. So um, just by your eye, this is already a kind of smoking gun for, for the creation of the quark one plasma. All right, so um, I mentioned charmonium. That was the, the original um, bound state uh, uh, that, that Matsui and Sats and, and company um, it, uh, looked into because this was the one at Rick and, and SPS Energies where they had some some chance of creating them right? at, at lower energies. You don't have, you don't create very many bottomonium, but looking forward to, to LHC energies, um, you start um, increasing cross sections and, and you generate a lot more of them. So that made it practical to consider. They, they can measure this in the lab. The other reasons are of course, because the bottom mass is, is on the order of five JEV and the bound states have, have masses on the order of 10 JEV. That means we can we can use effective field theory, and in principle, because we have a large mass scale, um, it should be more reliable. I already mentioned this point that, uh, or maybe I didn't, but um, yeah. It also, as the mass increases, um, these the size of these cold nuclear matter effects decrease. So, you know, in principle, if we could do toponium, that would be the best. But top, toponium, as far as I know, it's is not stable, and we'll we'll never measure it. So this is the best we can do. The other thing that the large mass of bottomonium buys you is that um, because this is much, much higher than the temperature that we generate, which is on the order of uh, a factor of 10 down from this, let's say it's, it's scale 1 GeV, um, any thermal production of a bottomonium state, so I just spontaneously pop some bottomonium out of the vacuum uh, and an anti-bottomonium or something, right? A uh, bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark to make this thing. I have to, the, the suppression factor for this is e to the minus 10. So that's just not going to happen. Of course, you know, as physicists, it happens, but it's, it's, in the, it's so small that it just doesn't matter. And that means that you're not gonna produce them thermally in, in, in LEC types of events or rig. Um, all the production will come from initial hard scatterings between the gluons uh, primarily in the, in the incoming nuclei. So that's good. They're produced early um, at around, for the one S it's produced at around 0 0.2 femto uh, uh, seconds after well, Fermi per C. So 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the nuclei finish passing through one another. And then they fly through the quark on plasma and then they have an imprint uh, of uh, the, 
of the quark and plasma evolution left on them, but that they're no, there's no more produced. And also because you know at LEC energies, it's still relatively rare to produce these bound states. Um, you're lucky if you produce one of these every, I believe the number is around a, a million collision events. And uh, to produce two of them in the same event is like, <laughs> uh, yeah, don't, it's not going to happen um, at these energies. So there's, there's less probability for what people in our community call regeneration. What is regeneration? Well, it has lots of, of different <laughs> ways to um, come about, but the, the old school idea of regeneration is the following. Let's say that I created two, uh, two bottom odium states and both of them broke up, but they happen to be nearby in space, for example, and then they can, they can recombine uh, the one quark from the one that, that, that fell apart and an anti-quark from the other. Now, of course, you need to have a high density of those states in order for this to turn on. And that's why for, for bottom onion, when you simply have a single uh, bound state flying around, it's not gonna be this sort of uh, regeneration through having dance partners, if you like to call it that. Now, there, there is a kind of regeneration that occurs, which I'll, I'll talk to you about today, but it's what, um, for bottom onion, but it's what I'll call quantum regeneration. And hopefully that will become clear as we go along. Let me, let me pause here and ask if there's any questions. Uh, sure, sure, Mike, do you want to uh, try to motivate why you would scale by binary collisions instead of, I don't know, any, any number of other possibilities like energy density or, or participant number, stuff like that? Well, you just count the number of binary collisions. No, but why? Uh, why would you choose binary instead of something else? Because um, you could scale it, any any number of things change from PP to uh, you could you know it's some it's a choice to to choose scaling right. by binaries. Could you motivate why you why that's the the reasonable choice? Because you could do participant scaling, you could do energy density, you could do any number of things. Right, but the binary one is the standard one that people use in the definition of RAA. In fact, right. Um, well, so I guess, that's, but okay. Yeah, that that is in RAA explicitly is that in the numerator you scale by the number of okay. binary. Uh, that, again, that's that. This goes back by definition. So yeah, that it goes back by definition. But that's the standard that was established in the community. Now you, okay. um, it, it always okay. made sense to me in the in in the you know, um, you I, there could be modifications from wounded nucleons, right? That I had one scattering and then I can't have you know the second scattering and won't be as efficient or something right at, at producing um, this thing but in practice what what the experimentalists present to us is scaled by n bin so that's what i'm going to compute <laughs> oh okay um, now you could just make predictions without having to use the scaling for you know just the final event counts here and then you wouldn't have to worry about that but we just normalize by the same thing and that's that's in the definition of our is that clear? Uh, yes, sorry, I, I, I muted. Yes, that's clear. Okay, thanks. Any other questions before I go on? Okay. All right, so <laughs> continuing on the theme of why bottomonium, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we know about bottomonium. Um, as I said, the mass is on the order of 5 GeV. If you um, calculate the spectrum uh, of states for bonomonia, um, here are the experimentally known uh, masses for all of these states. And you can just use some non-relativistic potential model. In this case, it was just some Coulomb, uh, sorry, a Cornell potential with some spin orbit and spin-spin interactions, and you, you can describe the spectrum of these states. I, I, this particular table doesn't have the splitting, but you can even get the splitting between all of these P-wave states. And as you can see in the last column, the, the relative errors are, are quite small, even with a crude model that doesn't even take into account these splittings. Um, and underlying this is just it's hydrogen atom physics, right? You're solving a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation, in this case, in an isotropic uh, potential, um, and out come the spectrum of these states, and you can just then go compare them uh, to the PDG. 
And what you find from such solutions is that the average relative velocity of the of the core of the bottom corpse inside of this thing is on the order of 0.1 times the speed of light. And what that means in practice is that you you know this uh, non-relativistic model that you've used is is reliable, and that's why it, it so well describes the data. Because as you might know, um, you have to get VB you know much much closer to the speed of light before the relativist effects start to become important. In this, um, in this non-relativistic limit, there are predictions for how the, um, the, the level spacing should go. And it should go like mass times velocity squared and also how the, the, this hyperfine splitting goes. And it should go like MV4. So using this, you, should, you, should, you have a prediction that you, these, these hyperfine split states should be very uh, uh, strongly clustered together, which you can see here from, from the data. And, and an estimate for you know, the splitting between, between all of these. And all, all these states are very well reproduced by just using this uh, kind of non-relativistic model. Where does this non-relativistic model come from fundamentally? Of course, you could try to write down some potential that was non-relativistic, but what we would rather do is start from QCD and then systematically uh, derive uh, the model. And the starting point for this um, in the first step is, is non-relativistic QCD itself, which was introduced by Caswell and Lepage in 86, and then uh, further developed by Bob and Bratton and Lepage in, in the mid nineties. And there um, you, you basically make a heavy core mass expansion, and then you can rewrite um, the QCD Lagrangian as a, a gluonic term, uh, light quarks, heavy quarks, which are the upper components of, of the bi of the four spinner. And um, this is are, are the light ones and then uh, the, the, the lower two components of the of the spinner. And this, these are interactions uh, between those. And, and in this we can we can see um, some some things here that uh, the leading order term is just non this D zero is just the non relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation. We see spin orbit uh, spin magnetic field coupling. We see spin orbit coupling. So all of these are, are included in this. Now you, I've only showed it expanded through order one over m q squared here. Um, you could go to higher and higher order and it's systematically improvable um, in, in that manner. Now, um, I gave you some, some listings of the, of the different effective field theory ingredients and their scales over here. Now, let me just quickly step through that. So first, the mass. So we have the mass of the, of the bound state itself or the quark, it doesn't matter in this case, uh, um, because they're both much, much greater than the temperature of the medium and lambda QCD. And because this, um, this is true, we can just integrate this scale out perturbatively. And that's what generates this uh, effective Lagrangian for, from NRQCD. Um, there are some other scales in the problem. Those were the, the hard, uh, hard gluons have on the order of this mass. If the soft gluons now using the language of hard thermal loop perturbation theory, instead of having a G sitting here, the small parameter is V. So we have some um, soft gluons with momentum MV. Then we have some uh, potential gluons, which have um, MV and MV squared. I don't want to go into the details down here, but uh, these are the, what we would call the ultra scoff scale in, in, in normal high temperature QCD. You now, written in this form, uh, you can uh, you still have individual quarks, but you can do an, another uh, step, which is to integrate out this scale, the soft scale, which is MV and essentially collapse down all of these four quark, quark interactions into point-like interactions with some coefficients, we'll see ma matching coefficients that turn out to be the potentials. And so you can write down the form of the effective field theory, then using uh, matching compute um, the potential that you have to use. And when you integrate out this second scale, the soft scale, what you get is an Lagrangian that's written completely in terms of singlet and octet degrees of freedom. I'll show you that on the next slide. It's uh, manifestly gauge invariant. We can now connect uh, more easily to QCD uh, with lattice or with lattice QCD. And this is summarized in this little picture, what I just said in the last few slides. We start with the QCD Lagrangian. We do a perturbative matching of the scale M that gives us NR QCD, then we integrate out this scale MV, and that gives us this potential NRQCD Lagrangian, 
and as associated matching coefficients. So this is what the, the Lagrangian looks like. Um, there's a, the gauge sector and then everything else that was involving quarks has now been written in terms of explicit singlet degrees of freedom, octet degrees of freedom, and their interactions among one another. Um, what I show you here is just at leading order in this, um, in this expansion, you can go further, um, but I don't wanna complicate things today. At leading order, what you find is that the, the singlet potential that's sitting here is nothing but the attractive uh, singlet potential that you would get in QCD. The octet potential that's sitting here is the repulsive octet interaction that you would get. And then um, there are dipole-like interactions between the singlets and the octets where I can make a transition from a singlet to an octet by absorbing or emitting a gluon or I can, I can also go octet, octet. So both of these are encoded in these interactions. Once you've completed the matching calculation to determine these coefficients, Vs, Va, Vb, and Vo, um, you can now use this to do the calculation. You don't have to use uh, QCD anymore. You now use this Lagrangian and you start writing diagrams down in terms of uh, these degrees of freedom. What's shown in the bottom right is, uh, is um, is some, it's in uh, schwinger keldish so this is propagating along the 2-1 contour. And, but what's shown in here are little diagrams where I had a singlet coming in, um, I, it split into an octet gluon and an octet uh, state in here, and then they recombine and go back out. Um, and so this is just a kind of self-energy um, for, uh, for the singlet states and the octet states. Now I show this particular set of diagrams because it actually enters into the calculation of the evolution equation for the, the quarkonium density matrix. Let me pause and ask for questions. Okay, all right. So with that as our Gangia, um, our con the conceptual problem that we want to solve now is the following. So I have some quantum mechanical um, state called capital Psi here. It need not be a, um, a single eigenstate. It can be in an admixture of these various uh, states. I just showed 2s, the one and 2s here, but the, the sum goes on forever. I could um, express the same thing um, in terms of the density matrix where Pi is just the probability of being in eigenstate Psi I, and then I have to sum over all possible states. I'm going to take this initial quantum mechanical state, I'm going to shoot it through the quark gluon plasma, and then I'm going to let it escape on the other side, and then I'm going to measure the outgoing wave function. Um, it's going to have some uh, modified coefficients here, and the survival probability of the 1s state is the um, mod squared of a primed over mod squared of a. So what's the relative probability of having it from the final to the initial state? And likewise, I can um, I can couch that in the language of the density matrix. Now, I'm talking about the density matrix because the next slide is going to have the, the density matrix on it. It's, it's, fun, um, it's, it's at the core of what we're going to do. Now, um, I've shown it as a brick. Um, as you're going to see in the future, of course, the things are created inside of the quark gluon plasma and they propagate through the quark gluon plasma. And the quark gluon plasma is also expanding. Um, so things are complicated, but um, that, that's our basic problem. We need to take some initial wave function, get the final wave function, and compute the survival probability of a given eigenstate. state. Now, um, these guys propagate um, through the plasma for quite some time. The plasma lifetimes on the order of 10 Fermi over C. They're all formed at less than one Fermi over C, so they really experience a, a good amount of time by heavy ion physicist standards. By normal people standards, of course, uh, this is 10 to the minus 22 seconds. It's very short. Now, during this time, what can happen is that um, bound states can break up and potentially reform due, due to in medium transition. So I can, as I said earlier, I can have a singlet coming in, it can absorb a gluon, go to an octet, but then it can later emit a gluon and drop down from the octet back into the singlet. That's what I would call quantum regeneration. So how we're going to address this formally is using um, a framework called open quantum systems where we take our entire system um, and then we split it into two pieces. Um, the medium degrees of freedom, which consists of the light quarks and gluons, and then a probe, which is our, our heavy quarkonium state. And then uh, 
formally, what you can do is start from the path integral and then use something called Feynman Vernon uh, influ influence functionals to integrate out um, the, the medium degrees of freedom and get a partition function or generating functional that, that only works for, for the probe. In practice, um, it, um, it amounts to the following statement that I can take the total Hamiltonian, I can decompose it into some, some probe part that has a trivial medium and some medium part that has a trivial probe part. And of course, there's still gonna be some interactions between the, the probe and the medium. And it, it's here where you have to use the Feynman-Vernon influence functional to include those when you're integrating out things correctly. Um, for us, I'll show you what this is. Um, in a second, what is the interaction term? So these just come from our P, P and our QCD Lagrangian in the end. Now, if I were to sum over both the probe and the medium degrees of freedom and construct the total density matrix, um, then we know how the total density matrix uh, evolves in time. It's simply given by uh, the following evolution equation that has some commutator between the total Hamiltonian and, and, and this thing. And this is unitary in the sense that, you know, the, the trace over rho um, will remain, if we start with trace rho is one, it will remain run at all times. So that's just the conservation of probability. However, what we're interested in is, is not the total density matrix. It's something called the reduced density matrix with row probe, where I've traced the medium degrees of freedom out. Um, and in general, it depends on, on, on three time scales, uh, what kind of equation you're gonna get over here. It's not gonna be as simple as this one. Uh, in general, they're called master equations. Um, and in the Markovian limit, these master equations um, become what are called Lindblad equations. So we already discussed the tail, the, the scales. So we have the temperature, we have the bound state mass, which is much bigger than the, the, than the temperature. We have the Bohr radius, which is a very small thing because the mass is very large here. Um, we also have the Debye screening scale in the system um, because we're at finite temperature. And then of course the binding energy, which is the sort of ultra soft scale. And you, these, the time scales that matter um, for this, quantum evolution are, are the following three. Um, something called the medium relaxation time, which is just some operator um, uh, correlation function evaluated with medium operators and then, uh, statistically averaged. Uh, physically, what this is, is, is just the, the, the time it takes the medium to relax if I perturb it a little bit. Um, and that relaxation time uh, is um, in the high temperature limit is, is on the order of one over T. So, and this turns out to be a very fast scale. Um, so the medium relax very, very, very quickly to perturbations. The next scale that we need to worry about is what's called the intrinsic probe time scale. And this is the time scale associated with transitions between those different um, levels. So again, you can think of that as a hydrogen atom. Um, there's just spacing between the levels and that sets a, a, a time scale associated with that spacing, which is one over the binding energy. The final scale is, is the probe relaxation time scale itself. So if I shoot this probe through, at first it's flying along a given direction, but after sufficient interactions with the medium, its direction would also be um, scrambled. Um, and, and this um, is, um, is, is down here. And, and you can parametrically estimate that in PRN at QCD. Now, what you find when you write this down and you and you'll find that the following um, scale um, separation um, is, is in practice. Um, because the bound states are, are small, um, this, this scale is much greater than the temperature. Um, these two scales don't have to be very far separated because this one is typically G times T, this one's T, but G is order one. So these two scales need not be separated, but um, they, they should be the case that the temperature is much, much greater than the, than the binding energy. And if, if that's the case, which is the case for, um, for LEC collisions, then um, this relaxation time for the probe and the intrinsic probe time scale are much, much, much larger than the medium time scale. So this thing, the medium essentially relaxes on a much shorter time scale than, than anything associated with the probe. And in that limit, that master equation that I indicated schematically on the previous slide um, becomes a Markovian evolution equation. 
where I have some evolution equation for the reduced density matrix. It has a, a, a normal looking commutator term, but it, then I get some extra terms that are sitting here. And these extra terms are now encoding the internal transitions that are possible um, within the bound states. These C operators are called collapse or jump operators, and they encode, as I just said, jumping from cingulate to octet, changing angular momentum. That's all going on in, in these C operators. This Mike, can was... you say again about the time scales? Um, yeah. So um, the, the energy levels are, I mean, the, the, the ground state is, you said 500 MeV bound by 500 MeV. Yep. And then the other ones are a couple hundred MeV different. And is that right? A couple hundred MeV higher. And yep. so that's the length, the time scale for that suggests one Fermi over C. And you talk about the probe relaxation time scale. So I would have thought that would be one Fermi over C, but aren't these collisions you're talking about with these jumping around, aren't those on a faster time scale than one Fermi over C? Um, these, um, yeah, these are happening on this time scale, those um, So that's a one Fermi over C, right? Because that's yeah. the energy difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the the uh, collisions that you talked about the time scale separation, but aren't yeah. the uh, things that are make it jump into the octet and back to the singlet or from the upsilon? Well, limit? well, they're they're buffeting this guy more frequently than it can respond, right? So there's a certain response time, and that's this. Oh, right? so it's the other way around. I thought you were suggesting it was the other way around. Okay, so these collision thingies are going around faster than the the one yeah. Fermi over C. Okay, right. And then the system okay. has some. <laughs> has to have some time, which is set parametrically by the level spacing to, to do the, to do the jump, right? So real, so that's really saying that at any time, it's some kind of weird mixture of all these states. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And luckily by going back to the density matrix, we can now include this, right? We can okay. include the possibilities that it's in any state and be it singlet or octet. Um, it's all, it's all in here. In Thanks. <clears throat> Good. All right, so a little bit more about this equation. <clears throat> I've highlighted two terms in red here, um, which I'm going to combine, but let's ignore that for now. Um, H probe is, is the original Hermitian uh, probe uh, uh, Hamiltonian. It includes these singlet and octet states. As I said already, these CNs are these jump operators that connect different internal states. And then um, there's some interpretation for this equation. Um, the, this, this product of CN dagger CN corresponds to the partial decay width in, in the nth channel. So this might be <coughs> the decay width right, for our singlet state to break up into an octet um, that's encoded in one of these decay channels. Um, if we sum over all possible decay channels, that gives us the total width for the state. So what we can see here is that this, this sum here, sum over N of this stuff, that's nothing but the total, the total width of the state anti-commutated with this guy. And it turns out that you can co combine these terms, the red, two true red terms into a uh, non-Hermitian effective Hamiltonian where I subtract off I over two times, times the, the total width. And after I do that, um, the, the Lindblad equation can be written in the following form where I have some commutator term. It looks different now because the, the Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. Um, and then some, some thing that's explicitly associated with, with these internal transitions. Now, um, these terms uh, in red are diagonal. So they preserve the quantum numbers of the state. So you, they, th there can be no jumping during this. Um, but because the, the Hamiltonian is, uh, is non-Hermitian, the, the norm of those states can, can decrease. This is the ones that, that represent the off-diagonal contributions that connect the different states. All right, this, this slide had a lot of details. I just wanna um, go through briefly um, to show you what the structure that we use is. Um, this is quite general. You can write it down for any Lindblad equation. So for us, what we need to specify is what's the effective Hamiltonian? What are these jump operators? To do that in a transparent way, I just suggest stopping at, at this decomposition where I take the total density matrix, I de uh, decompose it into singlet and octet blocks. And now I'm going to treat everything as either singlet and octet, and my state vectors are, are two dimensional state vectors. In that decomposition, my probe Hamiltonian, this is the explicit um, uh, permission part of it. And this is just the, the normal 
um, non-relativistic singlet Hamiltonian with an attractive quark interaction. This is the one with the repulsive. Um, what you find um, after doing this sum over CN dagger CN is that there's some modification of the real part, um, which comes with a coefficient, which is called gamma. Gamma is related to some time ordered um, correlator between chromoelectric fields um, and the imaginary part of that. Um, this, because it modifies the real part, is kind of like that screening effect that I was showing you before. So this is the screening effect in this, in this language. The other part um, down here is the sum uh, over you know, CN dagger CN. It gives you the, the width operator. It comes with a, a different coefficient, um, which is called kappa. And this turns out um, to be expressed as the same time order product of, of chromoelectric fields, but now just the real part. And, and this actually um, is not unique to heavy quarkonium physics. This is also relevant to open heavy quark physics. So if I wanted to know the um, rate at which an open heavy quark was flying through the plasma diffused in momentum space, um, that's set by this coefficient kappa. This is the heavy, the heavy quark momentum diffusion constant. So there's an intimate tie between open heavy uh, uh, flavor physics and, and closed. Now gamma is, is special to um, the closed state because it represents this mass shift of the, of the bound state. Now in this two by two representation where I have a block diagonal row S row O, these jump operators, you can write them down from that self energy uh, calculation I, I, I showed you in pictures before. And you, you see that you get some set of, of six matrices in this language that allow you to connect singlet, octet, octet, singlet, and octet, octet states. If I put in a singlet here, I'm going to get out an octet. I put in an octet, I'm going to get out a singlet. This, the, these last two couple octets to octets. So <clears throat> we know what these, these things are. And they're encoding all of these possible transitions, which I've said in words, I can, I can absorb a gluon, go up to an octet. Um, I could just go back down or I could do some more complicated dance where I, you know, I, I went around in, in this space. So this is what I mean by the possibility of quantum regeneration. All of that is included in here. It's still in the dilute limit. I'm, I'm assuming there's only one BB bar pair flying around, um, but I can still regenerate the states. Um, during their traversal. <clears throat> now to complete this, um, to turn it into a code where we can calculate the evolution of the density matrix, we need gamma and kappa. And for that, because they can be defined in this way, it turns out you can just measure them on the lattice. What, what's shown on the, on the right is an extraction of kappa scaled by T cubed to make it dimensionless as a function of T over TC. This is going to super, super high temperatures down to temperatures that are relevant for the experiments. The lattice data are the <clears throat> black uh, lines here. And the result that we're going to use is this blue band that's been fitted to the lattice data, which came from, from a PR and a QCD uh, prior paper. There's, there's less known about this, um, the modification of the real part of the potential, which is encoded in this transport coefficient gamma hat. Here's some <laughs> sketch of it. This is perturbation theory. All lattice results seem to live over here. Um, so what we've done is we're just gonna vary this guy in, in this range. So now, now everything's fixed. We just have to, to solve this equation. Now, the problem with this equation is that it, it, it doesn't stop here. I mean, we can't just decompose into the singlet and octet uh, sectors. Um, the traditional approach would be to further decompose row S and row O into angular momentum eigenstates, and then discretize the wave functions that are underlying uh, the, the, the density matrix itself on some lattice. But what you find is that this matrix quickly becomes a very, very, very big matrix with, with, with size on the orders of you know, tens of thousands. And then you have some matrix equation to solve over, over here, um, which you know, as the matrix size becomes huge, just becomes harder um, naively with a, a, a power of the matrix size cubed. And in addition, you won't even be able to fit it on your computer. So what we came up with uh, or stole more precisely from the um, atomic physics people is an algorithm to solve the Lindblad equation called the quantum trajectories algorithm. And that algorithm works in the following way. I'm just gonna, it's a Monte Carlo sampler if you like for this, uh, for the Lindblad equation. 
I start by generating a random number between zero and one. Um, and I evolve the state um, with this blue block here. Uh, as I said before, this blue block uh, conserves the, uh, uh, the color state and angular momentum state uh, of the probe, um, but not the norm because it's uh, not Hermitian. The norm will then drop below. If it drops below my random number, I trigger a jump. That turns on this term over here. And the jumps then have, and I don't want to go into the details here, um, there's a probabilistic way to pick which jump operator you uh, apply, and then you apply the jump operator, you renormalize the wave function, and then you uh, generate another random number and start evolving with the blue block until you trigger a jump, you jump, and you keep going back and forth like this over and over again. Now, the wonderful thing about this is that this blue part here, um, at least for an isotropic quirk and plasma, you can reduce this down to solving a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation instead of a 3D one, um, just by using one, a, a decomposition into YLMs. So this, this part is cheap, and then doing the jump itself is cheap, and then we just compete, we keep repeating this, and we'll have a, a solution to the full 3D Lindblad equation, at least for an isotropic thermal system. And those jumps are just jumping us around in this, in this uh, quantum space over here. The really wonderful thing about this algorithm is that each, uh, each path through the quark quartland plasma, we're now going to sample some set of random numbers, evolve, jump, evolve, jump, evolve, jump. Um, but all of these are independent. They don't need to talk to one another. So it's, in, it's what's called embarrassingly parallel. So if I want to, to do this a thousand times, I just fire up a thousand independent cores and, and ask them to do it. And then I average the result in the end. To make predictions for heavy ion uh, physics, we also need to take into account um, the fact that the, the, the medium through which they're flying is evolving in time. So um, for this purpose, what we did was take um, output from a three plus one dimensional anisotropic hydrodynamics code that comes from here at Kent State um, and was previously constrained to reproduce all the soft hadron spectrum, anisotropic flow, et cetera. Then we, sorry to repeat this, we, we allow it to evolve and then we shoot lots of these uh, uh, quantum mechanical wave packets, if you like, through uh, the quark gluon plasma. Now here I showed 200 or so, but we're, we're really just sampling one at a time. I just show you that, you know, we sample a bunch of them. We sample the initial production points um, from, um, from uh, the number of participants. Oh, no, actually, sorry, from the number of binary scaling. Sorry, I said it wrong, Scott. I knew uh, you made me double think. We sample it from the number of binary um, uh, scatterings. There's a profile. We sample that. And then we sample their their transverse momentum uh, based on PP production cross sections. So they're very steeply falling with a spectrum that goes like one over the transverse energy to the fourth. And then along each of these physical trajectories, we average over some large set of those random number numbers when we're solving this in the Monte Carlo fashion. And then we're, we're going to collect up all the data um, and bin them um, appropriately. Good. So what we extract in the end is um, from this procedure is what's called the survival probability of the state. So I take um, a given eigenstate um, labeled by quantum numbers L and M. I project it onto the wave function after this evolution, modulus uh, squared. And I, I, as I said earlier, we scale this by the initial overlap. And this is the survival probability for that, that state. Now in practice, as I said, these. The, the lattices we use are, are, are quite large, um, both in the number of points and in the volume. Um, and if somebody has a question at the end, I can try to explain why that is. Um, but you, you couldn't do this with a real 3D solver. You, the, the fact that you can cook it down to a 1D uh, problem is, is key. Now, after having solved the Lindblad equation for each of these, um, at some point, they do escape the quark clone plasma, like this little guy here. But the story is not over, because this, remember, is a quantum mechanical wave packet that is now a linear superposition between 1s, 2s, 3s, all, all possible um, uh, states are hiding here. Um, but the excited state parts of that wave function can then subsequently decay down. 
and that's what we call feed down. Um, there's a lot known about the feed down chain in, um, in bottomonium. For example, a 2S um, can decay directly down to a 1S and um, all of the branching fractions for these processes are listed in, in the PDG. You can collect them into a, a nice um, matrix that if I feed in some um, occupation numbers or probabilities you like, if you like, for each of the states, 1S, 2S, the three P wave states, the 3S, the three 2P states, and the 2D, if I feed them through this matrix, this then takes into account the fact that, that, that the states can feed down. So schematically, uh, what we do is we take the direct protection cross sections. These are pre-feed down. Um, they're feed down corrected PP results. So we get this from experiment. Then we sample the guys with this, these cross sections. We propagate them through the plasma to calculate their survival probability in a given class or observable class. And then we, we send them through the feed down and then we, we scale that by the experimental results. So that, that gives us um, AA. And in here, Scott, there was a factor of number of binary collisions on the top and number of binary collisions on the bottom that canceled just from the definition of our AA. Good. And we can do this for, for each state of type I. All right, so that, that's what we do in practice. Um, and before I show the results, let me pause and ask again for any questions and check the time because I'm, I'm, I'm in the last slides, but I just want to see if there's questions. Okay, so how do you how do you justify um, using sort of the same initial creation probability? Because you've been calculating the survival probability, but if if I make a B and a B bar, you know, in a PP collision as opposed to a heavy ion collision, there's a very different number of options. In a heavy ion collision, a B right. and a B bar, they don't, you know, there's so many more options of other particles to bind to. Of of uh, you know, they can be free. So even if the binds the, the properties of the bound state were identical, maybe there's much less probability they're gonna find themselves in a bound state to begin with. And so uh, right. how do you- Yeah, so I, I, I've made the bold assumption that I'm going to ignore that. That's what's done here. I just assume okay. that, the, that the local production is not affected by the nuclear environment. Now, okay. this would be so lumped into have, uh, what's you called- have, you, don't, you, you feel that's a leap of faith at the moment? It's a leap of faith, but it's one that I, I tried to emphasize in the beginning that there's yeah. sort, okay. sort of some justification for in the sense that there is a, um, I, you know, there is some effect, right? And it's encoded in the fact that these two curves well, are the Well, curves the, the, the P-LED is not the same as, as the number of options available in a heavy ion environment. So, I mean, sure. no, it's just heavy in lead-lead, so, okay. Sure. Now, I mean, you could include that, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we try to work in steps over here. Um, okay. <laughs> you, you, you could start putting in, you know, some nuclear modification or due to the fact that you're in the lead lead environment to this one here. Yeah. That, that could be done, right? uh, but we haven't done it yet. <laughs> All right. So um, after we sampled um, millions of physical trajectories, millions of quantum trajectories, I, I kind of lost count how many we sampled. We were able to make plots like this. So what this is showing is RAA versus N part um, for the non-heavy ion people in the crowd. N part is telling us the, the number of participating nucleons in the collision. Over here is peripheral collisions and over here is central collisions. Of course, in a peripheral collision, we expect this thing to eventually go to one because it starts to look like just a, a single nucleon nucleon collision eventually. And then we, we expect to see the maximal effect uh, when we generate the longest lived quark clone plasma. The data points here are for the 1S and for the 2S um, are the unfilled ones. And uh, they're collected from these experiments. And then laying on top of this is the, are the results from this quantum trajectory code. In the left, we're varying that transport coefficient kappa, and on the right, we're varying gamma. And uh, the central values, as you can see, seem to describe the data quite well. Um, we see some larger variation with gamma, which might give you some hope that if they were to eventually pin down the error bars here through increased statistics, that you could start getting constraints on the transport coefficients from, from RAA itself. Um, 
if you look at the, the double ratios, this story becomes even more interesting. Um, so if I take the, the suppression of 2s relative to the 1s, on the left is varying kappa, on the right is varying gamma, we can see that there's very little sensitivity to kappa um, when we, 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 we do this ratio. And that's because um, increasing kappa increases the width directly. And that suppresses the ground state and the excited states um, at the same time. And so there's sort of a correlated suppression here. Whereas changing the real part of the potential, which is one done on the right over here, um, that, that can have a different effect on, on the ground state or the excited states due to quantum mixing. And this, the same story hold, held true for the, the 3S. So we have some hope that, again, with increased statistic, uh, experimental statistics, we'll eventually be able to, to, to constrain these fundamental transport coefficients with experiment rather than, than lattice. Um, because we also sampled the PT, we could also make pre uh, model predictions for um, RAA as a function of PT. Once again, it seems to describe the, the data quite well, um, and the variation with gamma is, is bigger. Um, in the last two slides, I wanted to show you that um, with this new code, we can also do um, upsilon flow. Um, what was shown in this little animation was, uh, was a sort of mid-central collision where it wasn't perfectly isotropic. And you can imagine that if, if one of these bottomonium states shoots out along the short side versus the long slide, it might uh, experience less suppression along this direction than this one because it simply has a shorter path length. And so there were some interesting in calculating um, the, the, if you like, differential suppression of these states depending on, on which direction they fly in. And this was extremely interesting to experimentalists because there had been past measurements of this same observable, V2, basically measuring this difference of suppression along these two directions. And they did it for the, for the JSI, and they found that this thing had a huge flow signal or differential suppression, whatever you want to talk about. Um, in this case, um, the interpretation was it was true flow, that the flow um, of the medium was being picked up by the charm quarks and that the charm quarks were, were thermalized. And so people um, naturally wanted to see if the same thing was happening with bottom. Now there's admittedly some large error bars down here on these three points, um, but from, from Alice, you can see that it, it's very flat and it doesn't look anything like the, the J size. So this is um, sort of more evidence that we can treat the, the bottomonium as a sort of nice unthermalized probe of the quark on plasma. It's, it's, our, it's our bowling ball that we can shoot through. Now there's some theory predictions down here, uh, which were from old models. Um, myself and, and, and Ralph, um, I'm not saying they're bad, they're, they were just old. We've now been able to, to update this using this new Lindblad equation solver. Um, there's lots of panels here. This is the V2 for the 1S in different centrality classes. Um, the, the thing is different ordered. So the central collisions are over here, peripheral collisions are over here. The bands are showing our theoretical uncertainty. Um, Hopefully in the future, these error bars on the, on the um, experimental data will come down, but already if we integrate over all centrality, so we just don't care whether we had a peripheral or a central, we just calculate the suppression. That's what this number is. Uh, we can see that we have a, a highly constrained prediction and uh, at least the, it's, it's lining up with the, with the experimental observation. The bottom shows two S and we have, very precise predictions in this case, and we, we can't wait for it to be con confronted with data. All right, with that, I, I'll apologize for going up over. Um, so I'll, I'll leave the slide here, but, uh, but first say that what we've been able to do is really the first full 3D quantum and non-abelian treatment of bottomonium suppression within this open quantum system framework. There's a code, you can download it today. Um, version two is near completion. Um, in version two, we're including some next to leading order terms in the binding energy over temperature. Um, and that should be coming out any, any week now, I hope. <laughs> All right, with that, I, I will stop and ask for questions again. Thanks, Mike, for this interesting talk. Um, so any questions? Okay, I'll keep asking questions for, for you, Mike. So um, at, with all that uh, rattling around between states that you, that you model the density matrix, mm -hmm. um, 
have you compared it to say how well it might follow uh, just for the bound states anyway, the relative population staying th uh, thermal? Um, yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't stay, they don't stay thermal. So yeah, if you, if you, um, if you just calculate the thermal occupation numbers uh, for these things, yeah, it's and it's I just much, mean like the relative, relative possible, the relative. Uh, you mean uh, like one s relative to two s? Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, it's 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 not close because I checked. Um, yeah, so and, and people are, so there's um, papers See? by Yukana Akanawa, so uh, Akamatsu, Akamatsu Yukana. Yeah. Where he looked at this, and um, you could eventually get to Boltzmann um, sort of relative suppression, right, to one S to two S. Yeah. But it took um, three thousand Fermi over C. Really? Even though you said yeah. you have this very fast rate, I mean, of, yeah. of little collisions, that's surprising, huh? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it's they're they're just super heavy. I mean, you can ha have these internal transitions, right? I mean, but, yeah, yeah, but uh, so you had these jump. It sounded like those rates were fast. Um, so I would, I would have thought they would have come out therefore thermal or close to it. Okay. No, they do not. Um, yeah, so they used a slight. It, it was a it was a Lindblad equation there in those studies. Um, instead of using PRN or QCD, they used sort of model potentials. But there can, yeah, the, the time scale was just huge. Okay, and and uh, as another question, so you have these uh, you know octet solutions, and I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure what that what that means. Um, um, you know, is there some cutoff or I mean, uh, because of course if you have a color octet, there's infinite energy associated with the vacuum, but is there just some um, just how do you is is there a difficulty defining what the binds what the binding energy is of of uh, one of your octet configurations? Well, we, we never actually have to refer to its binding energy in the evolution, right? So but, in, but it, it has a relative energy relative to the, the singlet, right? So you need... Yeah, but we don't, um, and the code takes care of this for us. We don't have to compute that binding energy, but yeah, there, there is a... Um, so they don't have yeah, like... And, and I, you had I mean, they're not cartoon. bound, right? So what the binding energy doesn't even make sense for that. Well, because you had you had a picture of it, but but that cartoon um, was not supposed to be sort of literal then. Which um, I want to say you had a parallel bunch of states, and one maybe one was maybe they weren't octet and, and a singlet, but I thought you. You mean this ladder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Is that just supposed to be cartoonish and not the idea? No, no. I mean, we we have them explicitly, so I mean, I could start. It, shows, it suggests they're all the, they're like the same energies, whether the singlet or the octet, the bounce. That's what it's. Yeah, like. this this is just a cartoon. This is just okay. to indicate the the angular momentum numbers. Um, this is not energies. Levels. Oh, okay. Okay. These are just the groupings in L. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean these these are completely unbound. Um, I mean they have a, you know repulsive potential. As soon as you jump into one, the the wave function starts spreading out, right? Okay. Um, and if your box isn't big enough, so now I can explain why the box had to be so big. Um, you you can start hitting the walls, right? And then weird stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, so the box has to be big and, uh, enough that you know there's if they need to come back into the singlet, they can. Um, I mean, there, there's also a singlet unbound states, right? I can just sure. yeah. put in a, something in the continuum here. Essentially, these are all continuum states, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, the code takes into account that all of those automatically. We don't make any explicit expansion in bound states. We just discretize the wave function. It has both bound and unbound states in it, and we evolve them. And so you can also do uh, there, you know, at least people talking about measurements. Maybe they, maybe they did them already. Uh, about uh, I'm sure I think so. About uh, uh, open bottom, open bottom. They certainly did it with open charm, open charm, or, or open anti charm correlations. Uh, have are they, are, is there a chance they'll do that with a bottom also, or maybe they already have with with open bottom? Yeah, they're doing it. Yeah, and it's a different formalism than this because this is written explicitly for the bound states. But um, yeah. Okay. You can apply the same open quantum system formalism to open <laughs> heavy flavor. Okay.